a New York state of crime. I'm Rebecca Lieb. I'm Jason Horton. And this is Ghost Town. Well, the police are sure they're going to find the bodies in the woods. But in fact, that's not what happens. Kendall tells them the bodies are in the attic and crawl space of his house where he lives with his mother, his father, and his sister. In all this time that we considered Kendall a suspect, we never thought for a minute that he would have uh, all these bodies stored in his house while his mother, his father, and his sister lived there with him. When young women began to disappear without a trace in late 1996... In Poughkeepsie, New York, police eventually came to the conclusion they might have a serial killer on the loose. We're talking about Kendall Francois, the monster of Poughkeepsie, the Poughkeepsie killer, or his childhood nickname, Stinky. Okay, I'm in. I don't know if you're someone who has a hometown serial killer, nor would you want one. You should not want to have one. There's serial killers out there that are unidentified right now so you wouldn't know if you did or didn't and i'm not counting if you live in a huge city where you can claim richard ramirez in la yeah that's cheating that doesn't count this one is poughkeepsie's own serial killer where i used to live i used to live in poughkeepsie and i lived in poughkeepsie at the time when he was serial killing that's the worst part when you're there at the active point of their lives and you don't know it That's what freaks me out. And this story also ties into a movie that came out in 2007 called The Poughkeepsie Tapes. They are unrelated, but they're not unrelated. In fact, sometimes when you look up one, usually the other comes up as well because it's a movie about a serial killer in Poughkeepsie. Hmm. Okay. And that has its own story. And when I did an episode for Too Scary Didn't Watch... We talk about the Poughkeepsie tapes because it was on their list, and it is a very disturbing movie. But since it's a hometown story, I figured I owed it to the world. You do. Even though no one asked to (laughs) talk about this and the fact that there's a pretty good chance over the years that might be someone that walked past at the mall or a supermarket. Oh. Oh, that's creepy. The women that came up missing had one thing in common. They were all sex workers. When when that usually happens, usually the police response initially isn't great because it's just another prostitute. It's another sex worker. Yeah. That befell tragedy. And you almost, I'm sure they like to write that off pretty quick. It's not like it's an an assemblyman or the, the child of a celebrity or anything like that. So yeah. That becomes unfortunate in that they usually are an easy target because it's part of their job. Their profession entails going to somebody's house or somebody's car, and it might be someone who's unsavory. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it was, and in this case, it was at least eight different times. But there were no – so the women would end up missing, eight different women. There was no crime scene, no bodies. And as far as the investigation, they really had nothing to go on. So it was tough. Kendall Francois came to light. But on September 1st, 1998, police hit the jackpot. Detectives had pulled into a gas station where all of a sudden a man came up to the car and told the police that a young woman had told him she had been assaulted just moments ago by a very large man. Luckily, police were able to locate the girl in question who confirmed the story and gave the officers a name, Kendall Francois which is a name that sounds like somebody that would not fit this description. No, yeah. It's such a It's like an assistant professor name. Yeah, it's a very it's a very misleading name, not that a name has anything to do with anything, but it just doesn't mm-hmm. sound if you said, you know, pick if you were writing maybe if you were writing a typical movie about a serial killer, might not be the name yeah. you would go with. It's more murder mystery party than it is serial killer. True crime. Kendall Francois was born on July 26, 1971, one of four children of McKinley and Paulette Francois. He was remembered by his neighbors as a large boy who taunted local children by his size, but mostly kept to himself. By the time Kendall was 14, he had reached six foot four and weighed 250 pounds. 
Unsurprisingly, due to his size, he was part of both wrestling and football teams before joining the Army after his graduation. 1994, Kendall was discharged and returned to Poughkeepsie. Just two years later, That's women turned up missing. Yes. Just, just 24 months. And to give you an idea, there's the town of Poughkeepsie, there's the city of Poughkeepsie, and there's crime in a lot of places. But in the area of upstate, to give you an idea, it's about an hour plus from New York City. In fact, when I tell people, oh, I, I went to high school in Newburgh, they're like, I've never heard of that. I was like, what about Poughkeepsie? Mm-hmm. Everyone has heard of Poughkeepsie for some reason, whether yeah. they heard it by name. It's been mentioned in movies. Yeah. In fact, I was just watching The French Connection. Yeah. They mentioned Poughkeepsie in there. So it's mentioned a lot. It's a it's a pretty pretty large city, but there are a lot of rough neighborhoods. Crack cocaine was a problem and it still is in some way. Sex workers, people are trying to survive. They're trying to mm-hmm. – that's all it is. People are just trying to survive and unfortunately you become – anyone becomes susceptible. But I feel like you become a, a, a target and you're somebody who's not high on the priority of law yeah. enforcement. And, and that uh, is also true for every city. It's every city. It's not – they're like oppressed and deprioritized because ex- yeah. of stigma around their work. We'll actually find that one sex worker actually went to the police and – they did nothing of course. about it. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, just another two years later, police located Kendall Francois and took him to headquarters. Over the next few hours, as Kendall admitted many things regarding the missing women, it became evident they had just found their serial killer. Kendall had taken all the women from their working their street corners or wherever they were found, and he would take them to his home and he would strangle them, sometimes just because he felt like it or sometimes disagreeing with how much they were charging. Whoa. It's a, this is a, we're t- dealing with a bad person. Yeah. This is just somebody who is just a bad person and had, I can't speak to their, their life, but it just seems like somebody that was also very unapologetic and mm-hmm. unsorry for what they had done. What we're not sorry for, taking this break. Hello, my dark darlings. We're in the thick of summer, and with this warm weather, people are out and about after a year of staying indoors. Which means the ghosts and spirits are also out to play, too. We have a new series of fan-submitted encounters with evil entities, tales of ancient folklore, and even small-town murder. Check out our new stories on the Something Scary podcast every Tuesday, if you dare. It looks like fall is already here. People are headed back to school and the office. For me, I'm looking forward to the spooky season, and as usual, playing Best Fiends. Best Fiends is my go-to when I need a break from researching true crime and the paranormal. Best Fiends is that perfect travel companion for that much-needed break. You can take Best Fiends with you everywhere, and it doesn't require Wi-Fi, so no excuses. Collect more of your favorite cute characters as you try to defeat one more challenging level. I've personally made it past level 700, and Best Fiends has over 5,000 levels, so the fun is endless. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Every time you play, there's always something new to experience. Make the most of your downtime, and spend some time with Best Fiends. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play for free today. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Hi, hello, how are you? Hello, hello. How are, how are you are doing? doing? Not well, well-ish. We'll take Wellish. Below well? Above. Let's take Wellish. Okay. Wellish. Everyone's Wellish. Everyone's Wellish. We can all Perfect. strive for being Wellish. Yeah. We can <laughs> We want to say hello to everyone who's listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you to all our patrons for the support. Thank you. It it helps. Definitely. And we want to say hello to the mayors. James Harrington. Hello. Dara Rosenzweig. Hello. David Bull. Hello. Ashley Matson. <laughs> Hello. And our governor, the one and only. You get one governor in this life, Avian, Avian Noble. Noble. If you didn't understand that, Avian, Avian Noble. Noble. If you didn't understand that, Avian, Avian Noble. Noble. Did they you got it. I think they okay. got it. I okay. think they got it. Okay. Good, good, good. I want to say thank you to our government. If you would like early access, no ads, no chit chat, just the good stuff mm-hmm. or mediocre stuff. Depends. <laughs> you make the call. Patreon.com slash ghost town pod. Want to read some podcast addict reviews? Ooh. Yeah. We they we love podcast addict. Do they love us? I don't know. Stove with a V says five stars. Things I like about this podcast that other reviewers had said no one likes and therefore wrong. 
Jason and Rebecca's political views, dating stories, <laughs> personal opinions, and chit chat about nothing. They're hilarious. <laughs> One time they talked about Rebecca's dates for legitimately 17 minutes of, no. of a 31 minute episode. Oh my God. That's early on. <laughs> That's early days. Oh, my God. Don't put minutes to that, please. Yeah. It's embarrassing. I don't even mind. Does the info <laughs> get lost sometimes? Hell yes. <laughs> Do I laugh a lot? Every fucking time, which I never curse, but unless it's a quote. Yeah, never okay. change. I love you. Wow. Wow. Okay. That's the best worst review we've ever gotten. <laughs> was that bad? I don't know. I don't think it was bad. No. Backhanded compliments. And this one's from Slank. <laughs> Five stars. Just the perfect amount of weird stories and great storytelling. Just wish they did more. <laughs> and other people are like, how about less? Yeah, they're like, don't answer that call. But anywhere you can subscribe, leave a review, leave a comment, wherever you listen to podcasts, it's all mm-hmm. helpful. Absolutely. It gets new people to discover the show, and that is very helpful to us, and just more is better. <laughs> That's right. That's it's, right. It's a qu- quantity over quality, is people what we've always said. not asked, and we have answered Nothingness. What we say is it's quantity over quality (laughs) and always date somebody you work with. It's always a good idea. That's right. That's right. Those are the two things. If you remember anything from binging our podcast at any point, remember that. Please. (laughs) I beg of you. Remember that. Also, Stitcher was kind enough to feature us in their spooky story section. Yes. Thank you, Stitcher. Thank you very much. Another place to rate and review, I suppose. So many opportunities to tell us you hate us. Yeah, or you like you like the worst parts of us. Yeah, we'll take that too. Do we look picky? They love that I'm not tall, honey. <laughs> yeah. And my low credit score. Oh, hell they love yeah. it. Absolutely. They love that about me. Absolutely. Here's somebody that there's nothing good to be said about. Kendall Francois. Kendall Francois was arrested on August 25th, 1998. The search warrant was drawn up and signed by a town court judge. Still, when a team of detectives and forensic investigators entered Kendall's house at 99 Fulton Street, nobody was ready for the horrors they were about to find. Oh, my God. And to give you an idea where this is, it's actually relatively close to Vassar. What? Are you familiar with Vassar College? Yes, it's just very... It's crazy because when I think of – it's a beautiful area, honestly. It's, like, really nice and, like, my conception of what you're talking about is the opposite of what you're telling me. With Poughkeepsie, yeah, Vassar College, I did not go there, but I went to a party or two there. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I did not attend there by any stretch of the imagination. Went to a kegger at Vassar? Yeah, but I was straight edge, so I didn't bother (laughs) with that that fun fun. stuff. But that was in the 90s. It was around this time. hate that. And his where his home wasn't necessarily – in a bad place, but where you go to the city, Poughkeepsie, perhaps to go to the corners and mm-hmm. see who's working. But that gives you a little lay of the land. I was gonna say, when I say Vassar, or I say Poughkeepsie, people understand that part of upstate New York. Kendall had hidden his victim's bodies all over the house that he shared mm. with his parents. At least make it a shitty studio apartment. No, it's, an, it's a, like a, a... Mom and I, dad with a backyard. Probably it's, a grill. It's a nice house. It's, it's a nice-ish house, modest House, somewhere in the attic, somewhere in the basement and crawl space. Many in such bad shape of decomposition, one officer reportedly ruined more than one pair of boots walking on human sludge. Oh, my God. Oh, who buy it? I can't. I, never mind. And if that wasn't enough, Kendall also kept his victim's skulls in a plastic kiddie pool in the <sighs> attic as if they were his trophies. I, I have a question, though. Did his parents, like, where were they? During this, they didn't know older, relatively sizable house. I suppose they didn't notice a bunch of skulls in a kiddie pool in the attic. They weren't. It wasn't outside. They weren't swimming in it. I guess, but like human remains, like the journals just stepped. You're not like, oh, there's a femur and like clothes and decomposed flesh. The victims: Wendy Myers, thirty; Gina Barone, twenty-nine; Catherine Marsh, thirty-one. Kathleen Hurley, 47, Mary Healy Giacconi, 29, Michelle Eason, 27, Sandra Jean French, 51, Audrey Puglisi, 34, and Katina Newmaster, 25. That's so sad. In August 2000, Kendall Francois was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and that life lasted until 2014 when he passed away from, quote, Apparent natural causes while incarcerated on September 11th at the age of 43. So there is a book by Claudia Rowe from 2017, relatively recently, entitled The Spider and the Fly. And according to the book, Wendy Myers, his first victim, Mm -hmm. 30, took his cash 
twice and then ran away. So there was a little bit, a little bit of that. A relationship having, previously. Uh, they had a, a transactional relationship yeah. previously, but she would sometimes take the money and run. But in 1995 or around there, one of their encounters before he killed her, it's believed that she gave him HIV. Okay. Because he tested positive for HIV in 1995. Okay. There are some that say that contributed to his ill health and death. Mm -hmm. There are others that say that wasn't the case, but that's an interesting thing to have happen. Yeah. You know, that you're a first victim. And I, I don't know if he made that connection because we're not factoring in other prostitutes that he didn't kill. Mm hmm. Or people that that he freaked out and got away yeah. before something could happen. Yeah, it's just the eight are the ones that are accounted for that he's admitted to that befell a tragic fate. Yeah, dying at forty five of nat forty two of natural causes certainly would point to maybe having some prior condition, but we don't know for sure if he had AIDS or if he contracted it. It's like yeah, he tested and, positive in nineteen ninety five. Oh, he did test positive. He did test positive okay, in nineteen ninety five okay. and. Killings started in between 96 and 98. Okay. And it's believed that he contracted that from his first victim, Wendy Myers, which is an interesting – it's a sad, unfortunate, karmic kind of thing. I don't know. It's just a, a, a connection that yeah. was, that was and made. Yeah, just AIDS at that time and the misunderstanding around it. And it's Her. just all just so much – It's a bad – Yeah, a bad, a bad mix of factors that created the deaths of these innocent women. Now, there's one account of a, another woman that escaped his clutches, and she went to the police. Debbie and Ann's confrontation with Francois, she worked as a prostitute, had a drug problem, and like all of his victims, picked up while she was working on a street corner, took her to his house where he tried to strangle her to death. She got away, went directly to police. Right? right. Right. Why don't you go to the police? Yes. Why haven't you gone to the police? Why is in the first place you've gone to the police? She did that. She did that. Just for the record. She gave them Kendall Francois' name and address, but they didn't believe her and never followed through with the information. Oh, God damn it. It's just like the stigma around certain groups of people is – it's like you could have prevented so many deaths – and, and because of your own bias and your own stigma and whatever is happening in your fucking brain, cops of Poughkeepsie, you just – you didn't. You couldn't. You could – oh, God. Those are always such frustrating parts of the story. She didn't say there was like aliens coming yeah. that kidnapped her. They're saying something like, hey, listen, this woman is obviously – maybe she's has – she's obviously under the influence or not. She's admitting she's not saying, "Hey, I'm a real estate agent." No, but she's she says, well, "Like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter." She gave this person's name to the yeah, police, yeah. and it, she's like, "This just happened to me. Can you investigate this?" And it doesn't seem like that's something that's hard to believe. It's not something very reasonable to yeah. to say. It's not, and maybe they're just like, "There's that stigma." Maybe, and if it's true, like that's what you get type thing. That idea of the trash takes out the yeah, trash. Of course, it's, like, it's awful. horrible. It's horrible. And even if they didn't, even if they just went there. And poked around. Yeah. Even if that just dissuaded him from doing things, it could have changed, at least possibly changed the course of, of what happened. Yeah. Or put him on their radar. Like, it's put him on their radar. Put him on somebody's radar. Do your job. I don't care what you believe. I, I honestly, I don't care. It's just like, do your job. That's what you get paid to do is to investigate things like this. And if somebody's come it, it's not like you're showing up on the scene and taking a statement. They're coming to you and saying something that sounds per, like something that would happen. Mm -hmm. And it's I guarantee it's not the first time these cops are like what For sure. what is a sex worker? Yeah. What is well, a, a sex worker being attacked by someone? I don't know what I don't understand the concept of that. Truly awful. So, speaking of awful, okay. Let's get into the Poughkeepsie Tapes. The movie The Poughkeepsie Tapes is interesting because it came out in 2007, went to some film festivals, and then was gone and didn't resurface until, I think, 2014. And it, when you have a lost film, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, people are like, I want to see that lost film. Yeah. What's with that lost film? I, I feel that exact way. And it's interesting to have a movie, the, the, the Poughkeepsie Tapes. Not a very exciting name. Anything with tapes is exciting, but it's like the Poughkeepsie tapes. <laughs> yeah. And I don't really see much of the writers and directors 
attributing anything to Poughkeepsie having a relatively high profile serial killer. Mm hmm. It's a very – it's just like thing that can't be a coincidence. And yeah. even though those the two stories aren't necessarily connected, it has to give a little bit to it. it it's got to add a little bit because otherwise the directors and writers I think are from Minnesota. Hmm. So it's not – they're like, hey, listen, we grew up here. We want to call it this. Yeah, they don't have much of a connection. We, think, we don't I, think. I, I don't yeah. – like, I, I was born in Hackensack. Mm-hmm. Oh, the Hackensack tapes. And I believe that – Kendall Francois was at least in some way part of the genesis of the story. Mm-hmm. And this is one of those found footage things, even in 2007, which in talking to Too Scary didn't watch. The the thing about in 2007 is I don't think we were burnt out on found footage stuff yet. No. Blair Witch came out in 99. Mm-hmm. Paranormal Activities around 2007. I'm trying to get the dates. Yeah, mm-hmm. probably around that. Maybe a little well, earlier than that. Even yeah. even now with like Kid 90. I I, yeah. I still think there's a place for it. There there definitely is, but as far as like the horror of found like, footage stuff. Yeah, like camera In cameras. 2021, mm-hmm. it's not the same impact as, you know, 1999's Blair Witch or say 2007's this movie or Paranormal Activity. Yeah, you mean in like what we will believe as real. Or, yes, where yeah. we're just like is this a true story? Yeah. And the Poughkeepsie tapes is interesting because there's two things happening at once. One, it's a documentary or a faux documentary. Mm-hmm. And the way it's filmed, it either is on purpose very – it's like almost satire-ish hmm. a little bit because you could tell that these are not – even in 2007, I'd be like, this doesn't really seem – It doesn't very, hit. It doesn't really hit or maybe that's the point of it. Again, this is 2007, so that when it finally mm-hmm. got its re- release, it's maybe exciting because it's now available. Mm-hmm. But there's really been no reason why it might be something like, oh, we never got distribution, and it was too, uh, it was just too much, too much of a pain in the butt to continue with. And then mm-hmm. it finally got surfaced, hmm. but that added to it. But the found footage part is all it's the juxtaposition of almost this not campy, but this I'm a reporter or mm-hmm. I'm a specialist. Okay. And I'm a police officer saying what happened that day. Yeah. It's like interviews. It's like talking head interviews. Interviews. Stuff. Yes. A specialist. But the actual found footage stuff is pretty terrifying hmm. because – and I think what's really smart is you have to use your imagination. They're showing you parts of it and your imagination runs wild with what's happening. And that's scarier because when, when they show you everything mm-hmm. – there's no imagination. You're seeing it all, and whether it bothers you or not is up to you. Like, oh, I've seen it all. doesn't bother me. Or I've seen it all. Pretty scary. But when it's just left to your imagination, it's pretty terrifying. It's pretty – it indicates a lot of pretty gruesome stuff. So even when we were do- doing that episode, it was a little bit difficult to c- go through mm-hmm. because it's so jarring. So they did some pretty – to give. I want to give the, the movie credit because they did things that were pretty – unique one random thing is just you could just see like somebody getting like just dragged out of a grave mm-hmm. and that in itself is is that somebody's already dead but what is happening to certain people and there's one main character you yeah, know, wait, th- give us like a little synopsis it's somebody who's a serial killer and they have the police find i think 800 vhs tapes in the home okay a- amongst some other things okay and that's how they maybe sort of make the a little thing, things found in the home of Kendall for Francois, I believe. Got it. So it's these videotapes they're watching. You've seen them, that those movies, those VHS movies. Mm-hmm. They parallel these. Looking at things on a VHS tape is more terrifying than watching it on Apple TV. <laughs> Do you know <laughs> yes. what I mean? Across the board, I think we all agree with that. <laughs> VHS tape that you find, and there's so many of them, mm-hmm. and there's like certain ones that are missing. So yeah. the movie does a good job of that. But the stuff that's happening, there's just like one character that's being kept there and it's uh, it just goes places that i don't even really want to talk about personally Ooh, so if you are want to see it so bad. if you listen if you're a, 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 a horror movie person or you're interested in a lot of a lost film uh-huh. definitely check it out i believe some of this film to be kipsy i think from what i saw like some of the aerial shots mm-hmm. i was like oh that looks like the mid hudson bridge but then the rest of it i believe is filmed in i believe they're from minnesota and some mm-hmm. and in los angeles because maybe there's Resources and production houses. I, I don't really know. I'm always interested in filming locations, mm-hmm. but it seems like Poughkeepsie is just the location of where it is. Packaging Kendall Francois, the serial killer, and the Poughkeepsie tapes, the movie, all in it's, one experience. Yeah. If you want to 
roll the dice, take your chances and watch the Poughkeepsie tapes. It's available. It's out there. I do not condone it. In fact, I'd say this in the podcast. I was like, I do not condone this movie. Suggest people watch it. But I also say, listen, yeah, I don't know what you're into, yeah. but it, it's definitely. Where did you watch? Like, where do you, where can I find it? I think you find it and it's, I think it's even streaming and, and such. And you can find, you know, on YouTube, people cover it and, mm. and, and talk about it. But the things that happen in the found footage parts are pretty terrifying. And, I'll say one thing about it that I also found was interesting is that oh, a fact is that the you're seeing a lot of things through the, the POV of the killer because right? they're holding the camera. Yeah. So you had that POV, but they purposely had somebody who was not a camera person be that camera person, which is good because when you have somebody who's like, oh, listen, I'm great. Like I'm a, a DP. Yeah. Everything's going to look too perfect. Yeah. But when you get somebody who's no, there's just somebody's like, here, hold this video camera and do it like any way you would do it. It has almost this very human like feel to it where this is just a regular sociopath <laughs> that's not necessarily, oh, I went to film school for a couple of years. Yeah. So I'm going to make sure I get all the shots perfect. So everything's like a, a little bit, maybe a little askew, yeah. a little bit jarring, which I thought was from, I was like, I appreciate that. Regardless of the what the content is of this movie, so that sounds terrifying. Yeah. So listen, and come to Poughkeepsie <laughs> when you get a chance. Yeah. We'd love to see you. That sounds great. If you haven't played Best Fiends, you're seriously missing out. Best Fiends isn't like other Match 3 style mobile puzzle games. It's an action packed adventure and a brain boosting puzzle game all rolled into one. You play through an actual storyline, watching your fiends become more powerful the more levels you beat. So if you're tired of crushing the same old candy, give Best Fiends a try. Download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. If you've never played a game that's so much fun it's impossible to put down, then you've never played Best Fiends. Best Fiends is the best Match 3 style mobile puzzle game out there. It's basically an action packed adventure and a brain boosting puzzle game all rolled into one. Most of the Match 3 games on the market are just the same old format with different colors and maybe cookies instead of candies. But Best Fiends is different. You play through an actual storyline complete with adorable collectible characters called fiends. As you get further along in the game, you'll watch your fiends grow from wee baby versions of themselves into full-grown characters. The more you play, the more powerful and helpful your fiends become. So if you're tired of crushing the same old candy, give Best Fiends a try. Download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. Play.